Hello from Jerusalem, and welcome to Beit Avichai. Thank you for joining us. Rabbi Elchanan Miller is a journalist, a Middle East expert who speaks fluent Arabic, and a teacher of Jewish studies at Pardes Institute. This series will take us to meet the Jewish communities of the Middle East through the stories of people who are part of these communities. Today, we'll be concentrating on Iraq and Yemen. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat for your questions, and hopefully at the end, there'll be time to answer them. And Elchanan, please lead on. Thank you very much, Tamar, and welcome and greetings to all uh, viewers of the Beit Avichai series. Um, my name is Elchanan Miller, and this series is called The Last Jews of the Arab World. It's a very dramatic and somewhat somber title um, for this series, but we are living, in fact, in a dramatic and somewhat sad time. Five years ago, I launched an online initiative called People of the Book, or Ahl al-Kitab in Arabic, where I endeavor to educate Arab speakers, Arabic speakers all over the world, about Jewish faith and culture and history. I started out with cartoons about Jewish customs like Shabbat, kosher food, clothing, etc. Then I moved on to a series of more in-depth discussions about Jewish faith with a Palestinian-Israeli uh, counterpart named Celia Jawabra. And then three years ago, I realized that there was a great thirst among my viewers, many of whom came from countries that used to have Jewish communities and no longer have them, such as Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Egypt, um, as well as countries that haven't had Jewish communities for almost 1,400 years, like Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states. Um, there was a huge thirst that I identified to know more about the Jews that used to live in the Middle East and North Africa, Arabic-speaking Jews who inhabited these countries for millennia. So that's what we're going to talk about in this series. Three meetings, three sessions in which we will, through the videos that I took over the last three years, um, try to examine the unique stories of each and every country of six countries, starting today with Iraq and Yemen. So let's begin. The Jewish communities in the Arab world based on statistics from, taken from the Jewish Agency website just last year, so they're hopefully quite up to date. How many Jews do you think are left in these countries? Well, let's take a look. In Morocco, just about 2,000 Jews still live, mostly in the city of Casablanca, a smaller community in Marrakesh, and small, very small communities in Rabat, and other, other cities around Morocco. But Morocco still remains, I would say, till this day, the largest Jewish community um, in the Arabic-speaking world, obviously in North Africa, probably still thriving or relatively thriving thanks to the protection and support of the King of Morocco. The next country uh, that still has a relatively existent or robust, relatively robust Jewish community is Tunisia. Um, Tunisians, Tunisian Jews still live in the island of Jerba, which is mostly inhabited by Kohanim, uh, priests, as well as the capital Tunis. But only about a thousand Jews remain in that country. When we look at other Arab countries, mostly in what's called the Mashrek or the Levant, the picture we have is much more gloomy, I would say. Um, in Syria, according to um, an article in Al Monitor from 2021, Roughly only about 40 Jews remain, mostly in the large cities of Aleppo and Damascus, as well as the small area in the, or Kurdish area in the north of Kamishli. In Egypt, according to a New York Times article in 2020 that looked into the um, situation of Jewish communities in that country um, in light of renovations that the government is doing to synagogues in Egypt, only about 16 Jews remain as of 2020, mostly elderly uh, women. In Yemen, according to El Monitor again in a separate article from 2021, just four Jews remain. We'll talk about the, the community of Yemen today. And in Iraq, based on a report by France 24, just four Jews remain. And even that number is debated. Some people think that only two Jews remain in Iraq today. It's interesting to note that in uh, contrast to the existence or to these very low numbers um, of Jews in the Arabic-speaking world, there are still quite
quite sizable communities in other Muslim countries in the Middle East, in the larger Middle East, that still thrive. Turkey still has 14,500 Jews living, and even Iran, a country which we consider, you know, one of Israel's probably Israel's biggest uh, enemy today in the world, still boasts um, a Jewish community of nearly 10,000 people. So that's noteworthy and interesting, and we can reflect on that and maybe try to discuss that in the questions, question and answer session at the end of this talk. So today we're going to start, as I said, by discussing two ancient Jewish communities, the community of uh, Iraq and the community of Yemen. So let's start with Iraq. But before that, um, actually, let's talk about why do I interview Arabic-speaking Jews. What's the point of um, doing these oral interviews? And so far, from June 2019, so over the past uh, three years, I've, been, I've interviewed over 50, about 52 uh, Jews of all ages, um, both fr from early, their early 20s till Jews in their 90s, some of whom uh, we'll see today. And why do I do this? Why do I interview uh, these Jews, these uh, migrants from the Arabic-speaking world? One really important uh, goal that I have is documentation. I often compare this to uh, the project that Steven Spielberg has undertaken to document uh, the stories of Holocaust survivors. Now, obviously, the story of Middle Eastern Jews is very different to the story and to the experiences of Holocaust survivors. But there, is, there are similarities, and the similarities are the fact that, as we can see, as we saw through the numbers that I've just presented, these are communities that are on the verge of extinction. It's a terrible uh, word to use, right, when we talk about live people. But just as languages become extinct, and some of the Jewish languages that have been spoken um, are also in danger of extinction, so too are these communities that have lived for millennia um, also on the verge of extinction. So it's not just the living stories of these Jews, of people who grew up in communities like Damascus and Beirut and Aleppo and Cairo and Alexandria and Baghdad and Basra, who don't exist anymore. There are no more Jews worshipping and living and studying in the schools of these countries, the Jewish schools and communities that existed um, decades ago. But also their language, their very unique dialects, their Jewish dialects, um, which were uniquely Jewish and incorporated words from Hebrew and also had special um, linguistic characteristics that are still studied in universities. Even I studied some of these linguistic classes at Hebrew University. These living examples of live, li living dialects of, of Judeo-Arabic are also on the verge of extinction. So there is great importance, I feel, to documenting uh, these examples of something that's really about to disappear. And the second goal, I would say, is peace building. There have been many different approaches right throughout Israel's endeavors to forge peace with our neighbors uh, to peace building. Some saw peace as a secularizing project, a project that should be done between uh, secularized elites. My approach is different. I come from a religious background. I am now a rabbi as well as well as a journalist, and I really believe that the language of culture, the language of religion, the language of history is a language that resonates very um, much with the broader um, Middle East. And I would say that this series of videos of Jews, which I called Jews of the Middle East, or Yahud al-Sharq al-Awsat, um, where I often insist, and I usually insist that um, my interviewees speak Arabic and speak specifically in the dialects that they grew up with and not try to fake a different dialect. Sometimes their dialects have diminished a little bit or have changed over time. Some of them have become more Palestinian because it's, a, it's the dialect that they used here locally if they were living and working in Israel uh, with local Arabs. But the fact that uh, today Arabs, Muslims mostly, living in Arab countries like Iraq, like Syria, like Egypt, which have really the highest viewership in my um, project, People of the Book, when they see someone who speaks their language, 
or speaks a regional dialect of their language. Um, it stirs something in them, it changes something in them, and from my experience it creates a huge amount of nostalgia and a huge amount of empathy. It's probably the videos that engender the, the, the highest level of sympathy and um, positivity among my um, Arab viewers. And that's one of my goals, is to show that Israel is not, as some might think, some sort of colonial outpost in the Middle East, but actually an integral part of the Middle East, um, not just because of the historic Jewish connections to this land, but also because the people that inhabit it today are part and parcel of the Middle East, and some of them, and many of them, actually um, speak the languages of the region, come, originate from the region. Not to diminish, of course, the importance of Ashkenazi Jews, which I am one of. So these are the two main goals of my project. So just to give you an overview of why I'm doing this. And now let's um, move on into the first country that um, I wanted to talk to about is the Iraq or Babylonian Jewish community. So the Jewish presence in Babylon, Bavel, um, which is current day Iraq, dates back 2600 years to the Babylonian exile by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586 BCE. And the Jews uh, trace their origins to that exile in the Museum of Babylonian Jewry in Or Yehuda, near the airport um, in Israel there is a synagogue or a model of a synagogue where they believe that there is earth that the Jews brought with them and that's the tradition that they that they hold earth that the exiles from the land of Israel brought with them to Babylon um, when they established that synagogue and put it in the foundations of that synagogue that they established back then whether this is truth or legend is a question that I think remains open but that's certainly the story that the Babylonian Jews um, tell and the Jews, right, as we say in Psalms on the river, rivers of Babylon, there we sat and wept as we remembered Zion. That's the origin of the Jewish community of Babylon. Some of them returned with the um, liberalization and the license that the Persian Empire gave Jews to return to the land um, of Israel or to Zion to rebuild the temple, to start building the second temple. But many of the Jews, as we know, remained in Babylon and later established the great centers of Jewish learning, the Yeshivot of Babylon. So the first wave happened in 586 BCE, and then there was a second wave of migration following the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, that was by the Romans, but also conversion of local Babylonians of the Zoroastrian faith um, to Judaism. And following this, Babylon gradually became the largest center, um, the largest Jewish center outside the Roman Empire. Trying to move on to the next slide. There we go. So, Babylon was a very traditional. Uh, community, as most Jewish communities were throughout the ages, but in the 19th century things started to change a little bit, right? And I've skipped over um, the Talmudic period, the Yeshivot of Sura, Pumpedita, Nehardea, um, these centers that are known to us, and of course the Geonic period that followed the Talmudic period, where again Geonim. Or, or Jewish scholars continue to teach and send responses and respond to Jewish questions. Um, so Babylon, the Babylonian community, remained a very devout and religious community for many, many centuries. But the first European Jewish school, Kiach, Kol Israel Chaverim, was opened in Baghdad in 1864. And that was the first sign of secularization or of European influences starting to enter Babylon and starting to enter uh, and try to affect uh, the modernization of Iraqi Jews. But in the first stages of that school, very few uh, students joined because the leaders of the community actually frowned upon those schools and tried to prevent this liberalization. The 1920s were really the heyday of Iraqi Jewry in terms of their integration in the greater Iraqi society. 
In the 1920 census, this was already when the British controlled um, Iraq following the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire. Just like the British had a mandate over Palestine following World War I and the crumbling of, um, of the Ottoman Empire that dominated or that controlled these lands, so too did, the, did Britain control not just what was then called Palestine and Transjordan, which would become the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, but also Iraq into the 1920s and 30s. So in that census conducted by the British in uh, 1920, close to 90,000 Jews were counted, 87,488 Jews. Five seats were given to them in Parliament. And uh, a Jewish finance minister, Sasson Hezkel, was appointed and served um, from 1920 to 1923. And this is still something that many Iraqi Muslims remember um, when they remember sort of the Jewish presence in, um, in Iraq. The dialect of the Jews, I'm told from people viewing the videos that I made, is similar um, in some ways to the dialect of Muslims living in Mosul, in the north of Iraq, but very different from the dialect that people, that Muslims specifically in Baghdad spoke both in terms of the sounds that certain letters make. For example, the letter Qa, Kuf, Qa, is pronounced by Jews Qa, like a guttural uh, Kaf or a Qa, uh, whereas Muslims pronounce that letter Ga. And a lot of words that, they, that the Jews use um, are different than the words that their Christian and um, Muslim neighbors in Baghdad used. And these groups lived such secluded lives for, for so many centuries that over time each one of these three religions, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, developed their own unique dialects within the city of Baghdad, which is a fascinating um, linguistic phenomenon, which um, I studied in university. Um, but often today when, um, when Muslim Iraqis will, listen, will hear my interviewees, the Jews from Baghdad who speak Judeo-Arabic or the Babylonian Jewish dialect, they'll often say, are these people from Mosul? Are they from the north? They're not from the north, they're from Baghdad, but their dialect resembles the Muslim dialect of northern Iraq or of Mosul. So that was the peak of Jewish um, success or integration was in the 1920s, but then in the 1930s things started going awry for the Jews of Iraq. And this is what I call the downturn. And in each and every one of the countries that we'll examine in this series, there will always be a peak, and then at some point there'll be a downturn. So the British mandate over Iraq ended officially in 1932. Um, an Iraqi government um, was appointed, but then fascism started infiltrating the country through German propaganda which of course intensified when the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933. And there were radio broadcasts that used to broadcast anti-Jewish um, and anti-British propaganda. So this anti-Semitic this anti trend um, in the 30s uh, went hand in hand with anti-British sentiment um, propagated by the pro-Nazi politician Rashid Ali Al-Kilani, who took power um, in a coup, in a military coup on April 1st, 1941, overthrowing the pro-British Iraqi government that existed before that. And everything really changed dramatically for the Jews um, with this revolt of um, Ali Al-Kilani. And um, Soon after um, his ascent to power in April 1941, Jews suffered the worst pogrom in recent history that they record, which is known as the Farhud. So two months later, after he took power, on uh, June 1st and 2nd, which was the festival of Shavuot, the Farhud took place, and Farhud means attack or pogrom, that's how usually it's translated, uh, where at least 179 Jews were murdered 
and an estimated 2,118 Jews were injured. And that really caused a huge trauma for the Jews of um, Baghdad specifically. It did take place in other cities across Iraq as well, but the epicenter was in Baghdad. And that's where, according to the testimonies that I've heard from the Jews that lived through the Farhud, that's where the decision was really made to leave Iraq, that Jews were no longer safe, that their government no longer could protect them, that their neighbors in many cases turned against them. But at the same time, there were other stories. But that's when many Jews felt that they couldn't be safe anymore. Um, Zionist activity already began in the 1940s. Even before the Farhu, there, were, there was already Zionist activity in Iraq. But Israel launched, after Israel was created, obviously, in 1948, Israel launched Operation Ezra and Nehemia in April 1950 to start airlifting um, the Jews of Iraq to Israel. And by 1952, more than 120,000 Jews migrated to Israel, and only a few thousand from a very large community, right, of over 120,000, a very, very large community, only a few thousand Jews remained after 1952. A second wave of migration, much smaller than the first, but still quite significant, took place in the early 1970s. So I'd like to show you two videos um, out of the some 10 videos that I filmed of Iraqi Jews. Um, one representing the earlier generation um, that lived through the Farhud, that experienced that trauma and how they talk about it. And the second of someone who is one generation younger and how he talks about his experience. So let's go first to Aida Hakim. And Aida Hakim is um, a very uh, ladylike elderly woman over 90 or about 90 when I interviewed her. Um, I went and filmed her in London in um, St. John's Wood. And um, Ida moved to London from Iraq in that later wave in the early 1970s. She did remain in Iraq for a long time, but she's also old enough to have lived through the Farhud, lived through the attack. And here um, in this little segment of the video, she talks about how that experience uh, affected her and what she remembers from it. So let's watch that now. البس قاط طوخ لأن قيب يبين من غاس الشارع يبين ليكون يضربون بغصات هاي ما أنساها أبدا بعدين رحنا عند الأسلام الذي بيت لقبال كلش جاء أخوش ناس وماكو جيبوا لبن جيبوا حليب جيبوا شاي جيبوا ما في إيش يعني هل قد سولنا فشي ما يتوصف العقل بهذاك النهار وهاي بعد ثلاثة أيام رجعنا وغير أوادم هم كانوا جايين يعني مو ويانا من غير إحنا غير أوادم كانوا جايين هم عندهم هم أصدقاء وياهم هم حموهم حمونا شوف طلع الولد مو مو بغاس الشارع واحد طلع أضرب يضرب الرصاص كل من يتقدم على هذا البيت أقتله رجعوا رجعوا قلت لك على الشارع من من جهة النهر من جهة النهر همي هذا المسلم اللاخ الذي رحنا عنده هم أولاده وقفوا قاموا يضربون بالهواء هالبيت ما يصح حد يتقدم خفنا طبعا alright let's uh, get back to me um, I apologize, the, the subtitles don't exactly fit what um, Aida has been saying, so I'll just sort of translate quickly what Aida was, was telling us. Um, Aida's describing how suddenly um, a mob attacked her home um, in the neighborhood she was living in. Um, they started shooting in the air and intimidating her family, but there were also um, neighbors there who protected her family and wouldn't let them 
uh, be harmed and actually threatened the attackers um, and told them to stay away. Um, so they moved to another neighbor's house and for three days they remained there until they could come back. So Ida remembers this event as a very traumatic event for her family, but at the same time also um, ha has very fond memories and very warm memories of the people that, that um, saved her. The subtitles that you did see come from the beginning of this video where I ask Ida whether she misses something about Iraq, whether she's nostalgic about anything, and often people who I interview say uh, they are very nostalgic for certain things. Ida says, no, I threw away the key when I left and I never looked back. Interestingly, she did live in Iraq for another 30 years after the Farhud. So the Farhud, which took place, as I said, in 1941, um, she, lay, she, left, she stayed in Iraq until 1971 or 72. So she did stay for another 30 years. Um, and um, really under Saddam Hussein is when things really got uh, bad for uh, the Jews of Iraq. Uh, Saddam Hussein, who came to power in the late 1960s, um, really started, um, or I think actually in the late 1970s, but even before then things got quite bad for the Jews of Iraq with the rise of the Ba'ath movement, um, the pan-nationalist movement that existed both, um, or pan-Arab movement that existed both in Syria and in Iraq. Um, under Arab nationalism, Jews fared much worse than under British colonialism or, um, you know, the protectorate of the, of the empires where they, there was much more pluralism for the Jews. So now let's move on to the second video. Um, let's go back. There we go. And this is uh, Khadr or David Bassoon. David Bassoon is someone who I filmed um, in the um, Babylonian Jewish Museum or the, the Museum of Babylonian Jewry, which I mentioned earlier in um, Or Yehuda. It's a beautiful museum. I highly recommend you visit it. It has displays um, of Torah scrolls and artifacts and um, the, the Ark from synagogues and a model of a synagogue. It's really worth the visit. Um, so that's where I found um, Khadr David Basson, who is an engineer, and he is the head of the Association of Iraqi Academics in Israel. He had lived for many years in the United Kingdom, just like Aida, but after a few decades there, from the 1970s, when he left Iraq, um, Khadr David Basson moved to Israel, where he lives today. So. Hopefully here the subtitles will be, uh, will fit the, the text or the, the, the words that he says, and if not, I'll translate for you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> لكن في الأسبوع الأول اللي أنا بالجامعة بكلية الهندسة قررت أنه يعني الكل يجب أنه يعرف أنه يهودي ما أردت أنه أسوي صداقة بدون ما يعرفون أني يهودي فبدأت المسألة هالشكل أنت ليش ما رحت بعثة للخارج لأن كانت المعدلات المعدلات الش يعني الشهادة مالي معدلاتها عالية فقلت لهم أنه ظروف عائلية ما ما أردت يعني أخرج للخارج بعد يوم يومين زين أنت ليش بسوي الطبية باعتبار الطب كان يأخذ الأعلى درجات فقلت لهم ما يخلوني آه أنت يهودي so this anecdote which I actually brought at the beginning of the video or the beginning of the interview with خضر ديفيد بسون um, I thought represented kind of the mood that um, Jews had living in Baghdad in the 1960s. The community had dwindled significantly um, to only a few thousand people. And um, people at that point were already scared of telling their friends, their colleagues in university, that they were Jewish. So you could hear in uh, Khadr's story that at first he would hide the fact that they wouldn't let him travel abroad. These were the types of limitations that the government placed 
on Jews. They couldn't travel abroad. So he had to lie and say that um, there were family reasons that prevented him from traveling. And then again, they asked him, since his grades were so high, why won't you study medicine? That's the best thing you can do with your high grades. And he said, they won't let me. There were certain professions, and this is something I learned from the interview with Khadr David Bassoon, that were, the Jews were prevented from studying uh, in those days. So you can see how, in addition to certain hangings and attacks that every now and then um, Jews would be attacked in their homes, all of these, um, in, you know, the threats, the, the growing fear the Jews had pushed them out um, of Iraq until their numbers have reached almost um, zero today. Now I'd like to move on to go back to the, there we go, um, go back to the PowerPoint and talk about the Jews of Yemen, the second country that we'll deal with today. Yemen, just like Iraq, is a very ancient Jewish community dating back millennia. There we go. So the origins of the Jewish community in Yemen are unclear. There's a lot of legend that surrounds the beginnings of that community. Um, most dated to the years preceding the Babylonian exile. So a few years before 586 BCE, that date we saw with the Iraqi Jews. But some dated back to King Solomon, or some even earlier than that. Um, that, of course, has no real uh, historic basis. But probably most likely, and most researchers think that Jews arrived in Yemen around the same time as Jews arrived, arrived in Iraq. The first documentation of Yemenite Jews is found in the Chimyarite Kingdom, founded in the first century BC by converts to Judaism. A lot of people trace the origins uh, of the Jewish community in Yemen to a conversion, a mass conversion led by the king of one of the regions in Yemen, Chimyar, which was an old kingdom um, that existed in the first century BCE, and perhaps the core of some of the Jewish community um, began with converts to Judaism in that time. And that at least is the first documentation of Jews um, that we have. Throughout the Middle Ages, as we know, Jews faced persecution by certain Muslim dynasties. Um, and they expressed that uh, distress in correspondence that they had with Moses Maimonides, who at that time lived in Egypt. Um, and was a prominent scholar and leader of the community. And we know of this correspondence between the Jews of Yemen and Moses Maimonides, um, in which he tries to encourage them and cheer them up and tell them that even in some cases, although they were forced to convert to um, Islam under the uh, oppression of some of these dynasties, they still are considered Jews if they moved back to Judaism. They're not heretics as one of as one rabbi claimed, one local rabbi in Yemen claimed to the Jews who had converted to Islam. Um, so we have Igeret Teiman, the famous letter of Yemen. We have Igeret Hashmad, right, known as Igeret Hashmad, the, the, the letter of um, conversion or forced conversion um, that Maimonides wrote to the Jews of Yemen in order to encourage them. So this dates back to the 12th century. Um, Jumping forward again hundreds of years to the 20th century, to the end of the 19th century, the first Yemenite Aliyah of 150 Jews took place in 1881 and was called E'ele Batamar. That's a quote from Song of Songs. Um, and it preceded the first Aliyah that we know from Eastern Europe, right, from Romania and Ukraine, uh, the Aliyah of Bilu, Aliyah Rishona. So, we know that you know, these very early uh, Yemenite communities lived near the Kinneret, right, in, near, the, near the village or the community of Kinneret, and actually came here as in what we could call you know, an, um, a pre-Zionist Zionism, right, that predated even the first um, official Zionist Aliyah, the first Aliyah from Europe. Like in Iraq, things were looking good or relatively good for a few hundred years. The Yemenite Jews were living in relative peace with their Muslim neighbors 
but again there was a downturn. And following the UN partition plan vote of 1947, or the, part, the vote over partition um, in November 1947, 29th of November, so three days later, on December 2nd, a pogrom took place against the Jews of Aden, which was, which was a British protectorate, right? It was sort of a British enclave inside uh, Yemen, where some 80 Jews were killed and dozens were injured. And this is, um, of course, the case in many, many Arab countries, where attacks took place immediately after um, the partition vote, that fateful vote that recognized... Um, the establishment of a Jewish state alongside an Arab state in Mandate Palestine. So there was a lot of violence that took place immediately after that. And of course, here in the land, the first part of the War of Independence broke out. Um, and in the UN, Arab delegates, of course, warned um, in the days and weeks uh, leading up to the vote. Um, the Iraqi ex ambassador, for example, all warned the UN against uh, supporting partition because they argued quite um, explicitly that this would lead to attacks against local Jews in Arab countries and would lead to anti-Semitism, and that, in fact, as we saw, is really actually what happened. Um, all Yemenite Jews, almost, who lived through this period fondly remember the Yemenite ruler who protected the Jews, Imam Yahya. And some of the older interviewees I have um, recall that their parents lived under sort of the golden age of Imam Yahya until he was assassinated in February, on February 17th, 1948. Unrelated to any Jewish question, it was um, an internal struggle between different factions within Yemen. But following that um, assassination, Jews were uh, arrested and attacked as part of the, the, the revolution that ensued following the assassination, and that's when things really started getting bad for Jews. And one of my uh, star interviewees from Yemen is a man called Mordechai Itzhari, which we will talk about in a second. But just to mention the statistics or some numbers about the Jewish community. So before the establishment of Israel, some 35,000 Jews which constituted 40% of the community, uh, lived already in Mandate Palestine. Um, this is even before the establishment of Israel, because as we said, there were waves of immigrants that came before. Um, Israel, when it was founded, soon after, um, initiated Operation Magic Carpet, known in Hebrew as Al-Kanfei Nesharim, or On the Wings of Eagles, in which 50,000 Jews migrated to Israel from Yemen, 35,000 of which within a five-month, a very short time span, five months between July and November 1949. So by the time, um, in 1949, by the time this operation ended, Yemen had very, very few Jews, maybe a few thousand. And now we will go to Mordechai Itzhari. Um, and... Uh, here I think we need to switch to the YouTube so we can get the right, so we can get the subtitles right. So Mordechai Tari, as um, you saw, was born in 1930, and he was a teenager when the Imam Yahya was assassinated. And he tells me from his home in Rosh Ain, which he was one of the founders of, the Yemenite city, um, again near the airport in the center of Israel. He lives in a street called Yitzhari Street, right, named after his family. And Mordechai Yitzhari, one of the elders of the community, the Yemenite community in Israel, uh, who wrote many books of poetry, liturgy, who still speaks fluent Arabic, both literary Arabic and the Yemenite dialect that the Jews spoke. Mordechai Yitzhari tells me about his experiences and those of his father as an opposition member during the revolution against the Imam. Al-Rasas, 
والبنادق خبوا في الجدر فتحوا الجدر بعدين ما وجدوا انش لما لما ابويا عرفوا عليه حكم عليه ارسلوه عسكري ما وجد ابي ابي هرب هرب بس يكوني انا رهينا ذلك ابن عربه رهينا حتى يصل والدي في اليمن في اليمن اللي ما بعصب نفسه كل المشايخ يجيبوا ولد ولدهم وولدها رهينا يعني وابويا قال لي اسمع يا ابني انا اذا كان يمسكوني ياخذوني مي على الله ما 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 كيف يقع وانت ياخذوك يحبسوك قبل ما ما يفروك ولا حاجه بعد جو لي في الليل وكنت لما انا وعلمني اقول انا منفرط عن والدي لما مسكوني قلت بس شو مني؟ انا منفرط عنه من قبل سنتين بعدين اجوا في الليل وجدوني عند امي في البيت دخلوني في الحبس جلست في الحبس بعدين كنت مرحبا سيدي النايب النايب هو النايب الحسن كتبت الامام احمد اني ذكر هذا اليوم جلال انا امير المؤمنين الناصر لدين الله رب العالمين احمد بن يحيى محمد حميد الدين نصر الله امين طالما التي بواسطتها جرحت اشفاني دما لا دما وكان البناء توجيهي الى الصباح والى الان عشرة اشهر ليلا لم ينقطع والله خلق الليل وجعل طرفه النهار واما الليله التي حبست في خلالها لم وجدت لا صباح والله لا يعاقب العبد ابن بابي ولا ابن بامه ولا ابن باخي وقال الله بمحكم كتابه العزيز ولا تزروا وزرة وزر اخرى او اذوني رجعني الى الحسن الى الاخ الحسن الاخ الحسن قال سننظر سنتامل ما فيش عندي جواب بس سنتامل بعدين رجعنا للامام الامام رجعني لابو طالب وابو طالب كتب لهم قال طال مساله حفص بن الظاهري طال طال مساله حفص اذا رايت مخذ الكفال في حسن السيره وعدم عوده الى محبوس لاجله فلكم الامر فقد طال مكثه محبوسا ابو طالب هو الذي عاوني ودخلني وبعدين انا اطلقوني هيك وكان لازم الحسن يختم الحسن ما كان موجود كان في تعز رحنا وخرجنا طلعت على البابور يلا فلسطين في So that's uh, the fantastic story of um, Mordechai Tzhari telling me about how he spent 10 months of jail time uh, for hiding weapons and for apparently participating in this revolution. But what's really remarkable about Mordechai Tzhari's story is his command of literary Arabic um, to be able to write um, a letter to the ruler in such flowery literary Arabic and quote by memory from the Quran. So that shows that some Jews living in Yemen at the time had very good command of Arabic, uh, had studied Quran, um, and knew to quote that from memory. And it's really still very impressive to see a Jew over 90 years old um, remembering by heart the, the letter that he wrote um, 70 years ago, uh, more than 70 years ago. Um, so a very rare um, person, Mordechai Tzhari, and I hope he continues to have a, a long and happy life. Um, he's quite old today. Um, the last video I'd like to share with you today before we move on to some, some questions and answers from you um, is with a man called Yusuf Hamdi. Yusuf Hamdi is one of the last Jews to have left Yemen just two years ago. And Yusuf Hamdi... Um, lived a very difficult life in recent years. Um, he lived in a community outside of Sana'a, um, in the area of Sada, which was taken over by this radical group of rebels, the Houthi rebels, uh, who are Shiite, Shiite Muslims loyal to the Iranian regime. And the Houthi rebels uh, attacked Jews, persecuted Jews, and forced them to actually leave the communities where they'd lived for, for hundreds of years and take refuge in a compound given to them by the leader of Yemen before the revolution, the president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And um, even during the revolution, their lives were still 
uh, threatened. As a journalist with the Times of Israel, I actually attended uh, the shiva of one of the Jews that left that compound in 2014 or 15 uh, and was unfortunately uh, stabbed to death by a Muslim radical. So life for the Jews of Yemen continued to be very, very dangerous uh, during the Arab Spring, right, which began in Yemen in 2012 and um, well into uh, the war that now is taking place between the Houthi rebels and the government, the official government of Yemen with involvement of regional powers like Saudi Arabia uh, and the United Arab Emirates, it's become a very, very dangerous uh, place for all Yemenites and including Jews. So the ruler of Abu Dhabi has agreed to host the family of one of the last families to leave Yemen, uh, Yusuf Hamdi's family, a man in his 40s with, two, with a few young children. And I met Yusuf Hamdi about two months ago in uh, the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, where he told me a little bit about the life of Jews in recent years and how they continued to teach their children um, Hebrew and continue to keep uh, Jewish rituals, including prayer and eat kosher food until the very last moment. And today there's less than 10 Jews left in Yemen. Um, Yusuf Hamdi is no longer there. But this is the interview that I conducted with him uh, just two months ago in Abu Dhabi. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, English subtitles for this, but we can see in the video that you'll see in a minute how uh, his children still read the parasha, the weekly portion, in the classic Yemenite tradition of reading it in uh, Hebrew and then translating it, called Tarjum, translating it to uh, Aramaic which is the ancient Jewish language, which is still a custom practiced in Yemenite synagogues to this day. And it's quite impressive that these children who are around 10 years old, give or take, um, still um, are taught Hebrew according to the Yemenite uh, tradition, even though they don't actually speak Hebrew, they only speak Arabic. So here's the video um, of Yusuf Hamdi. عدتنا وتقلدنا وتراثنا يعني عن الطاف اليهود يا وديننا ما راح نسيبه أنا مثلا أولادي إني أتعلمهم أنا أنا أتعلمت من أبي وجدي وعلماء اللي درسوني إني أنا أقول يعني حافظ على ديني وكل شيء لأولادي فهذا شيء الحمد لله أبني يدرس ويقرأ وكل شيء الحمد لله ما فيش اللغة المحكية في البيت كانت العربية اليمنية؟ أيوة الحمد لله العربية اليمنية والعبرية إمتى تبدأوا تتعلم؟ لا العبرية أكيد من الطفل لما يكون صغير نبدأ نعلم ألف باء هذا الشيء معلوم معروف عندنا يهود اليمن يعني يسموا هذا بالمكان يعني بالحيدر نعلمهم في المكان يعني ندرسهم يعني خلاص يعرفوا العبري لغة العبري الفصحى احنا ندرسها باليمن مش يعني اي لغة يعني مثل ما عندك العربي الفصحى عندنا احنا يهود اليمن اللغة العبرية الفصحى لان ننظرها بالعين بالحاء بالواو اللي ضمه وكسره نفس العربي العربي so that's Yusuf Hamdi trying to explain to, you know, the Arab viewers, including viewers from Yemen, that literary Hebrew or official classical Hebrew exists um, just like Fusha or literary Arabic exists for Arabs, as distinct from the dialect that um, many Arabs speak. So this is the last video that I wanted to share with you today. To summarize, we spoke today about two ancient Jewish communities that have now become almost extinct. Both in Iraq and in Yemen, communities that have existed probably from around the time of the first exile, the Babylonian exile, 586 BCE. So over 2,500 years of Jewish life are now on the verge of extinction. Less than 10 Jews live in Yemen, less than 10 Jews, probably four or five Jews live in Iraq. Um, and these are some of the stories of people who have living experience, lived experience in those countries. 
Um, and in the coming weeks, we will move, next week we'll move to talk about Syria and Egypt, and we'll end the series in uh, two weeks with North Africa, with Morocco and Tunisia, which we saw still have relatively vibrant Jewish communities. And now I welcome your questions in the few moments we have left. Thank you very much, El Hanan. I think it's fascinating for everyone here, whether living in Israel or abroad, to hear about the Jewish, these Jewish communities, which are a little less known, maybe. Um, we have plenty of questions, so I'm a, I apologize. We won't be able to answer all of them, but we'll try and pick a few. Um, so a, a question David wants to know, uh, could you say a little bit about schools in Yemen, maybe also in Iraq, that would allow Jews to learn literary Arabic and Quran? I mean, did Jews learn this within the Jewish community? It really depended on the school uh, that these Jews attended. In Iraq, uh, by the time the middle and the end of the 20th century came along, um, most Jews learned in Western schools uh, and, and learned Western curricula. They often went to alliance schools, which were the schools, again, that set up by Kol Israel Chaverim, Kiach, that same um, French organization that came in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and I'm not sure that those Jews in Iraq learned much Quran. Um, they did learn Arabic, of course, and they could converse in Arabic, and they had to learn Arabic literature. Um, I think their knowledge of Quran was limited. Um, in Yemen, as far as I know, and probably Yusuf Hamdi here is an exception, um, and probably Mordechai Itzhari as well, um, because he was living in the capital Sana'a, um, so probably, maybe even from his father, got a broader education about Quran. From what I know, and I might be mistaken here, but from what I know, um, most Yemenites learned in the very traditional Khaydar that Itzhari, um, that, that uh, Yusuf Hamdi, the younger interviewee, mentions, um, where it was really, really a very, very traditional Jewish upbringing, um, where they would learn with a teacher called the Mori, which they still have here in uh, Israel, sort of a Sunday school um, type traditional school where they learn uh, Torah according to the Yemenite traditions, the Targum, the, the translation into Aramaic, of course the specific reading of Yemenite um, Torah reading, and um, maybe in recent decades the last Jews to remain there had to take, had to go to official government schools and maybe could learn Quran, but traditionally I don't think many Jews knew the Quran. Do you have an explanation to why Jews still live today in Iraq and Yemen? The few Jews you mentioned that are still there? So, um, from the Jews that I spoke to, especially the family of that victim that I mentioned, um, that I met in Rehovot, he was buried, he was brought to Israel after his murder in 2014, um, brought to be buried in Rehovot, and families sometimes own property back in Yemen, um, some people simply are nostalgic and are connected to that country. Um, in the Shiva house, interestingly enough, I met Jews who were still traveling back and forth from Israel to Yemen to do business. I was shocked. I didn't know that Jews could still do that and travel even on a Yemeni passport back and forth between Israel and Yemen, but apparently some Jews still do that. Um, I think their cultural roots um, are so strong um, in Yemen that some of them just feel connected to that land. And it's a very tribal um, country, and some of the Jews there really, really are very, very Yemenite, despite you know having the traditional earlocks, and and the Hebrew, they still feel very, very Yemenite. Um, in Iraq, I think the story was different. I think that after the early 1970s, from 71, 72, only a few hundred Jews remained in Iraq, no more than that, um, and. In some cases, uh, they were stripped of their uh, citizenship, and it was very hard to continue to live as Jews there. Um, and the few that stayed were probably highly secularized, sometimes um, communist or people who identified with the Iraqi state, but those were really few and far between. Anybody who really cared about Judaism um, or Jewish education um, left Iraq by the early 70s. I think this will be the last question. I mean, there's plenty of questions, but I have to choose. Um, regarding the last Jews from Yemen, 
Why do you think they went to the United Emirates and not to uh, Israel or places where they're like big Jewish communities? So, um, again, that's a question I get asked a lot surrounding this specific family, uh, Hamdi's family. Um, and it's interesting because Yusuf Hamdi himself did study um, in Israel in a yeshiva for a, for a time, years ago. Um, I think the simple answer is that the package of benefits that he gets from the ruler of Abu Dhabi is sort of like a, a gold cage almost. It's something that's very hard to resist. He has a beautiful villa there. He has um, a nice car. Um, his children go to private schools that are very exclusive and very um, prestigious where they can study English at a very high level. So there are a lot of benefits there and he's still trying. He just got a Sefer Torah I think this week in Abu Dhabi where he can start reading and, and having services. Um, most Jews I should say that left Yemen did come either to Israel or to very um, orthodox Jewish communities uh, in the United States and in the UK there's a struggle um, which I won't go into now between the Satmar community uh, the very ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Satmar community that tried to draw in um, Jew, uh, Yemenite Jews to its community in order for them to preserve their very Orthodox traditions and kind of pull them away from Zionism where there's this risk of secularization and of course the Jewish agency and the Israeli um, establishment which obviously tries to bring Jews here and some families are even split between those two communities. Um, Yusuf Hamdi chose for whatever reasons to go to uh, the Emirates for now, I'm not sure that's where he's going to spend the rest of his years. I think it's a temporary place, but that's just my thinking. And just before we end, I want to remind everyone that you you have a website, right? Your project, it's called People of the Book. So if people are interested, you, you can also visit El Hanan's website. And um, a few people have been asking also about these lectures. Uh, they'll be posted on our website in the next few days. So if you missed anything, you cannot make up. So that's in response to the questions. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll be here next year with Elchanan to continue to meet other Jewish communities of the Middle East. Thank, Thank you. you very much.